but in recent years I've been doing you know a fair bit more with uh, machine learning and data science related things. Uh, Jill and I have worked very closely together. Um, so I'm uh, well. We can kind of see how it goes. Uh, the um, Jill's primarily going to be talking about machine learning, so I uh, focused uh, at least the first part of my lecture is largely on some kind of uh, statistics that's uh, kind of particularly relevant for particle and astrophysics. Um, uh, but then in the later parts, we can talk during coffee breaks and we can kind of choose the, the topics you'd most like to hear about. Um, part, you know, hopefully what my goal is is that by the end of these lectures, uh, you will see how the machine learning and statistics are, are very related to each other um, because I think oftentimes they're presented really as kind of two very different things, or at least they don't seem related at first. Um, uh, I was also curious in terms of putting all of this together, the kind of balance between uh, particle physics and astro. Um, so I don't, uh, who is more on the astro end of things? Okay, so a few people, but then primarily it's on the kind of particle end of things. Is that okay? All right. So, um, so I, I mean, I think the things that I'm saying will be generally, you know, generally relevant. But I, I did put, you know, more emphasis on some things that uh, pop up in particle physics. But I'll try to, you know, comment some on on the astrophysics side as well. So, um, okay. So, uh, without further ado, um, <clears throat> so. Um, so in terms of uh, statistics, I'm not really assuming that you know uh, much of anything. So I'll kind of start from uh, the ground up, but I'm uh, 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 but I will, you know, assume that you're smart people and pretty comfortable with calculus and things like that. So we'll go quickly over a lot of it. Um, the way and coming at it from a physicist's point of view, uh, I often draw this picture at the beginning, and I think it's a kind of reasonable uh, a reasonable start is that um, as uh, as theoretical physicists, uh, the kind of the primary thing that we do or you do is to make predictions, right? And so that prediction, if you think of it as sort of an arrow, it's going from uh, a, a theory, excuse me, uh, to uh, to predictions for what the data is going to look like, right? That's what we're doing as theoretical physicists. And <clears throat> I'm going to, in terms of notation, I'm. Uh, you can think about whatever theory you like over here. It could be the standard model, or it could be a lambda CDM cosmology, or something like that. And <clears throat> I'm going to generically uh, think of the parameters theta as, as specifying a particular theory. So what? So many of the theories have some free parameters, like masses of particles, or gauge couplings, or uh, you know the cosmological constant, and things like this. So these parameters are generically I'm going to call theta. And uh, so once you specify theta, then as a, a theorist, you're able to make predictions for what the data looks like, and I'm going to kind of generically refer to the data as x. Okay. Um, and now, uh, as experimentalists, you know, our job obviously is to try to build experiments, collect some data, uh, but the data should, of course, be relevant for testing a particular theory. Um, and so in the end, we're going to want to think about, you know, several different alternative theories and we want to say like which one does the data prefer in some sense right so we either want to like pick out a particular value uh, uh, parameters theta so like make the measurement of the mass of the particle or we might be trying to do something more like uh, uh, you could think of this theory if you want really as having for instance some component of theory of, could be choosing between two very different uh, uh, theoretical choices so for instance you could imagine I don't know like a uh, theory, uh, you know, with some particle present or not, right? Uh, so that the, you can think of those as different values of this theta parameter is like if you have this particle or not. I'm trying to think of it very generically. Could, so this could include, you know, supersymmetry or no supersymmetry, things like this. Um, so once we collect the data, we have the opposite uh, direction. Um, so if this first direction we think of as prediction, um, um, this inverse direction, we're trying to go from the data to say something about the parameters. Uh, this is inference. And uh, so when I think about statistics, I, this is kind of generally what I'm thinking about is from the data that we've collected, what can we say about the theory? And that is the sort of broadly the, the uh, statistical inference. Um, and 
<clears throat> some of the other language that people use, sometimes they refer to this direction as the forward model, and then this is kind of trying to invert the forward model or the inverse direction. Sometimes people talk about uh, these problems as uh, inverse problems and things like that. And <clears throat> one thing that's, uh, that's important to say, say here is that, uh, and I'll get, uh, this will be a theme I'll mention later on in the lecture, is that I think as physicists oftentimes we're trained in terms of uh, a kind of a deterministic way of thinking, even when we deal with quantum mechanics a, a lot and we know that there's indeterminism and that, you know, things are, uh, we, we often think about trying to make predictions in form of an equation. Uh, but when we're doing statistical inference, you know, the, even if you knew the parameters of the theory perfectly, the data are not necessarily fixed exactly. There's going to be some randomness involved. So when you try to do this inversion, uh, sometimes it's not unique. There can be several different values of the theory, you know, several different uh, theoretical scenarios that might be consistent with the data. And so this, uh, in this inverse uh, map, there might be several different points here that are consistent with the data. And so we're going to want to be able to, you know, develop language for dealing with that. Okay. Um, so the central player in all of this that's going to, you know, that we're going to use to connect these two uh, sides together is a statistical model. Okay. Um, Um, and, and I'll write that uh, as sort of generically as P of X given theta. Okay, so this, this, uh, this little uh, arrow here is, uh, is, in, is how you read it, P of X given theta. And this, is, this given means uh, you're thinking of it as a sort of conditional on. So like given that the parameter theta takes on a particular value, what do I think the distribution of the data uh, looks like, or what's the probability of getting a certain, you know, uh, uh, realization of the data. Um, so the, uh, so I'll say some more about this in a second. Um, so the, I also just mentioned a little bit that this, you know, when we talk about model, model is like probably one of the most uh, overloaded terms that you'll hear. You know, we think of models in terms of theory. There's a theoretical model, like, uh, you know, you know, some supersymmetric model or something like that. Uh, here I'm talking about a statistical model, which is going to, you know, there's going to be some particular equation here. So those can be things, simple things like Gaussians and Poissons. Uh, they can be more complicated things like what we use at the LHC when we're trying to uh, make measurements uh, of like, you know, the, the Higgs properties or something. We build a very uh, complicated statistical model for the LHC data that's parameterized in terms of, uh, for instance, effective field theory couplings and, and parameters that describe how the detector behaves and things like that. Um, and, then, uh, and then this term model will also be used when we're talking about neural networks and things like that. So, um, and uh, um, and that's when, in, in the case of neural networks, it's not always a, the, the model is not always trying to describe a probability uh, in this way. It might be trying to describe some function or something like that, but uh, this, this term model is like, highly, you know, overloaded term. So if, you, if you're confused about the way that it's being used, uh, uh, please let me know. And I, I know this is kind of a silly thing to say, but I'll, I'll, when I was learning about uh, machine learning and things like this, I often was like objected to the use of the word model. And also sometimes when people would uh, uh, interpret uh, a neural network as a probability function, I kind of, it bothered me in some way. And, uh, and partially because, as you know, I kind of had this attitude that just because your neural network outputs a number between zero and one doesn't, you know, make it a probability distribution. You need to work a little bit harder. Um, uh, but now I kind of see it in a different light that uh, that you can interpret it that way. But you should just think of it as a, you know, in that setting as a statistical model for the data, not be you know, justified at the same level like a prediction from theory comes from, but from the point of view of uh, how you're using it and inference and things like that, it might still kind of have a, a similar role. So, okay. Um, now, uh, let's see, what did I want to say? Uh, another thing here in, in terms of uh, notation, which is kind of silly, but I think is also important, um, is, you know, later we'll be talking about some kind of subtle issues that have to do with, for instance, Bayesian statistics. And, uh, and uh, humans are particularly bad at making a, a, a certain logical mistake when it comes to Bayesian statistics, and we'll, we'll talk about it later. Uh, but one of the ways that you can try to avoid making that problem uh, is, uh, is typically I use a, 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 a Roman font <laughs> uh, for, for random variables. And, um, and, a, and a 
and a Greek, you know, a Greek letter for parameters. Okay, um, so the the idea being that uh, that the the uh, that th this x here, the data, these are going to be treated as random variables. So um, so even if you did the experiment again, you know, the output of x is going to be random in some way, um, and th this uh, this is you know, totally convention, but I'd like you to think of it, if you're a physicist, in the same way that you do things like, like uh, this when you're talking about uh, Lorentz vectors, right? When you have upper and lower indices, you know how to contract them. This is, you know, manifestly a Lorentz scalar, right? Something like, like this is manifestly a Lorentz vector. You can just look at it and know, right? So if you're ever, for instance, adding, if you were adding these two terms, you know, you would know you made a mistake, right? Without thinking any harder, just because the notation is telling you I don't get to add scalars and, and you know, vectors together. Um, so in a similar way, uh, so w what's the important point about this? It has to do with how these things transform under Lorentz transformations, right? Um, and so... Um, when I talk about statistical models, uh, I'll, I'll mention a little bit about the transformation properties of these things in terms of if you change variables for x or theta, and they transform very, very differently. And those transformation properties are also related to the subtle issues around Bayesian statistics and things like that. So there's reason to, to you know, adopt some, uh, uh, some conventions. Um, and, uh, and, and I'll stick to this uh, with... Uh, there will be one place that's uh, somewhat of an exception that's like a, an exception uh, everywhere, so I'll stick with it, but I'll, I'll, I'll point it out when we, when we get there. Okay. Um, great. So, so far, so good. I know I'm the easy opening here. So, um, so the, <clears throat> um, what do I want to say? Um, okay. The, so the next thing I was going to, to say was, um, in terms of the uh, the particle physics and astro side, uh, uh, most of the time uh, in particle physics, uh, at least certainly in collider physics, what what we look at are plots that look so. So you know, if this is the sort of particle side of the board, um, we we tend to look at plots that look like uh, that look like uh, um, well, uh, say some some histogram or something like that. Um, um, sometimes there's a, a few different, you know, s stacks of histograms together. And you have data that, you know, looks like this. Um, and uh, so this, this uh, direction here would, would typically be some, uh, some variable that is the random, random variable. So this could be something like a, uh, an invariant mass. Uh, So you know this could be something like m, you know, uh, you know, the in invariant mass or something for some particle collision, um, and then uh, this axis is is then you know the uh, you know the the number of of events or the number of counts uh, you know per bin, right? That's typically what you know your the plots that you see in terms of the raw data look like, um, and uh, and so we're going to want to think about this kind of raw data in this form, um, and then, so we're going to want to make a statistical model that works for that, and then, uh, and then based on that, we're going to then want to do some inference on the parameters. Now, um, in, the, um, in the astro side of things, th there's, a, there's, a, um, there's a lot of uh, variation in terms of what people do on astronomy and cosmology and things like that, but <clears throat> one thing that... Uh, struck me at least when seeing a lot of uh, uh, you know a lot of uh, talks in, in astrophysics is that you, you see a lot more plots that look uh, that look like uh, something like this um, you know sometimes with big error bars or something like something along these lines okay and uh, and so so what are these you know what are the axes here um, th this um, so a lot of times the, the, the type of relationship is different. You're thinking of this as some kind of, this is more like dependent and independent variables. Uh, if you use this language, I don't know uh, if, uh, but you're, you're imagining, for instance, uh, um, that, uh, you know, uh, 
you're able to measure, for instance, like the age of a star or you know the temperature of a star or something like that, and then you're measuring some other quantity associated to it, and you're basically making a, a scatter plot. So oftentimes you would have um, uh, you know an, uh, something like an independent variable here and uh, and a dependent variable uh, here, and what you're and so if I called this something like y and I call this x, uh, then a lot of times what you're trying to do is you're trying to fit some model. Uh, f of x, uh, you know, given y. I'm sorry. You're trying to, um, sorry. You're trying to model uh, that y looks like uh, some function f of x, and then often plus, you know, plus some noise term or something like this. So this is uh, uh, some noise term. So I don't know if this seems kind of familiar looking. I mean, you've seen examples of plots like this. So, um, so I'm going to talk. Uh, less about this, but what, one of the things that I wanted to kind of get at is that um, is that the, the, the two can can uh, can work together. But oftentimes, when you see plots like this, if you imagine that you pick a particular value of x and you take a slice through it, you're imagining you know this is the, there's some prediction, and then you're kind of imagining that for this variable y that there's like a distribution. That looks that the the, da the data points are kind of scattering along there, and so that's what this epsilon is representing. Um, and and oftentimes when people say that it's noise, you know, oftentimes this epsilon is just some kind of very simple uh, like normal distribution of you know zero comma you know some some uh, some uh, so that here I'm referring to like a normal distribution, a Gaussian distribution centered at zero with some standard deviation or something like that. So in this picture, the statistics of the distribution are very simple, right? It just looks like a Gaussian distribution. And, and the, the, the more, you know, the thing that's of interest usually is the functional relationship between uh, y and x, right? So your, your, your focus is really on, on this kind of modeling. Um, and, uh, and so in particle physics, you don't see that so much. So, uh, an example where you would see it would be something like this would be the, uh, the center of mass energy of a collision, and this would be measuring like the cross section for some type of interaction. And you would expect some kind of uh, uh, growth of the cross section with, uh, with the center of mass energy, and then you would be testing that model. But you don't see those plots all that often in particle physics. Oftentimes, you see something like this. Um, um, and, uh, and, and the point here also is that, you know, oftentimes these distributions look crazy, right? You know, I mean, the, the, uh, they can have incredibly steeply falling distributions. You know, if you're talking about invariant mass, I mean, I drew a simple looking example here just because I'm drawing it on the blackboard. But, you know, if you were looking at uh, something like, uh, um, uh, like the, the, again, the number of, uh, of events, events in a bin, and this would be something like, uh, the invariant mass of two, of two uh, of two jets, you know that this has some you know very steeply falling distribution, and usually when you see it, these are plotted even on like log scales, and so there will be like six orders of magnitude between here and here, and your model and you know you're interested oftentimes in what's going on in tails. So th these distributions in particle physics that we run into, you know, rarely look like little Gaussian distributions. Um, if you, you know another example that you could give would be. Uh, for the four lepton invariant mass, when we were looking for the Higgs, you see um, you see a little bump that has to do with the the Z boson mass, and then a rise as you hit the threshold for four leptons, and then it falls off. And then you're looking for uh, this, which would be the Higgs. So this would be something like the Higgs, and this uh, would be coming from diagrams that are that are uh, doing something like like this with two Z bosons, and you know four leptons or something. So you see these very complicated looking distributions, uh, which are not at all like what you're kind of dealing with typically in, in astrophysics. But the, um, OK, so that's just uh, some kind of context. OK, so um, so now zooming in a little bit more on, on, uh, on this kind of distribution, um, let, let's start off to see if we can kind of think about what uh, a statistical model for uh, for a distribution like this might mean, okay? Um, so one thing that I should say uh, uh, over here, um, so I'll, I'll add it in this, is that in terms of the, the statistical models, um, uh, 
you have uh, you have uh, uh, discrete uh, discrete distributions where where you talk about a uh, a probability excuse me uh, a mass function. So so uh, so this is refers to you know when the when when the when the data x are discrete things, like I, when you roll a dice, you have, when you roll it, you get a, a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, or a six, you know, or when you count uh, the number of collisions, you know, there's some discrete number of them. Uh, so if x is discrete, then when you talk about uh, p of x, it's, it's uh, um, so this you could think of in terms of, you know, different possibilities that you ha might have, right? So it's an, um, there's some, you know, discrete set of, 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 of options. And so, uh, in this situation, uh, if, if uh, so, I'll write it like this: uh, x i. Um, if I if I sum over all of the different uh, the probabilities associated to all the discrete things that might happen, uh, I should get one. Okay. So, um, so even if I have like a, a you know a, a die that is uh, unbalanced, you know I have a probability for all the different uh, things that I might roll, and when I add them up, I should get one. Um, and if there, if it's continuous, um, then uh, 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 so if I have a continuous x, um, then I, ha I have the integral of p of x uh, dx should be one, right? So the con the kind of fundamental you know condition on probabilities, and then of course you also have uh, that. Uh, that p of x should be greater than or equal to zero, excuse me, for, for both of these cases, so you can't have negative probabilities. Um, and, um, and then uh, what else do I want to say? Oh, <clears throat> of course, so the units of this, if you will, are the units of this are probability, right? So it's kind of unitless. The units of p of x here is, you know, one over whatever the units of x are, right? So this is a probability density. So this is a, a, a probability excuse me, uh, density uh, function. Okay, so because of that, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, uh, it's uh, okay uh, for, you know, P of X uh, to be bigger than one, right? Because it's, uh, this is the probability density, right? So what you really need is that when you integrate some region, the, that integral, when you integrate over everything, it sums up to one, but uh, the the density at some and some can be bigger than one. Does that does that make sense? So for you know, for example, if I have a, a Gaussian distribution, you know, say centered at zero, uh, but the the standard deviation, say this is zero point zero zero one, right? You know, the, the you know the when I integrate across here, the the x part of the integral is some tiny number, so this is going to have to be very, very tall, right? So much bigger than one for it to, uh, uh, to integrate to one. So, okay. <clears throat> All right, so now, uh, so given that, when you look at this data, we could try to think about what's a probability model for this data, um, and also just like what is the, kind of what is the data itself, right? So, um, so here I'm showing it as a histogram, right? Um, I could also, uh, instead of having a histogram, I could have something uh, that looks like, uh, you know, some kind of, you know, crazy distribution, some nice smooth distribution in X. Um, and now I can't really draw, if I want to think of it as continuous, I would just have data, data points at different spots, right? So the, 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 you can think of those marks as the, as the individual data points, right? So, um, this makes it a little bit harder to draw, right? I mean, it's harder to visualize, which is why we tend to put things into histograms because they're easier to stick into plots on papers. Um, but this, you could you could think of both of these going on, right? Um, and if you want, you could also think of uh, uh, the the histogram here that I drew is just a is a step uh, a piecewise constant function, right? If you wanted to, you could think of this histogram as just like this curve, but it's just piecewise constant. Okay, so what I want to do right now is to think about a statistical model for uh, for what this data looks like. Um, 
Okay, does anyone want to, I don't know if it's uh, out of the tradition to be interactive here, but uh, in, any, uh, any thinking about what's going on? So how would we model something like this? So first thing we need to do is think about what the data itself looks like, right? So what does the data look like? Um, we can think about, um, we can think about both of these cases. Um, maybe it's easier to actually think about this bottom one first, okay? Um, so in this case, um, I have basically uh, the data X, um, uh, I, have a, I have a, sorry, the, the, the data overall is, is some number of events, so I need to think about how many events I have, and for each one of those events, I have a particular uh, a value of this quantity X, right? So I can think of the, all right, this way, the, the data is sort of uh, uh, a, a set, sorry, a set of uh, XI uh, with I ranging from one uh, to N. Okay, and N is the number of, of uh, data points that I've collected. So that, that's fine. Okay, so, um, so I, in this case, thing that's interesting is I have both some discrete component which has to, so I talked about discrete and continuous things, I have a discrete component which refers to how many collisions, you know, how many events I collected, right? So if I did this experiment again, maybe, you know, say in this example I had 25 collisions, you know, if I did it again, I might have, you know, 30 or 27 or something like that. So the total number of collisions is, is random and it has a discrete nature. And then for each one of the collisions, I have some kind of continuous number associated to it, like an invariant mass or something like that. Um, and that's what my X is. So I need to figure out how to model this data. Um, okay, so, um, so let's, let's uh, I don't know wh which one's better to focus on first. We need to think about both the discrete component and the, and the continuous part. So let's think maybe first just about the continuous part. Like one of those collisions, like the I equals one. So I've got my first collision as a particular, you know, say it's this one right here. Doo, doo, doo. Um, so there's, there's my first collision that has a particular value X. Uh, what is the probability for that? Right, I need to give this curve a name, right? So we can, you know, we can think of that as this uh, P of X, right? We could think of, okay, so, so I've got, uh, you know, for this particular collision, um, I have P of, you know, X1, right? And then I find uh, the I equals two, the second collision, and say it's uh, this one right here, you know, two, two, two. So this is, uh, so this is, you know, P of, you know, the whole curve is P of X, there's P of X1, this is, you know, P of X2, um, P of, you know, X2. Um, I, the total probability, you know, the probability that I got X1 and X2, if these collisions are independent from each other, I can just multiply all these probabilities together, right? So I'm not gonna bother writing it all out. So we're going to have a, a product from I equals one to N of P of XI. And so the assumption here that I can write it out as a product is that uh, th this assumption right here is what's typically just written I, I, D, period, and stands for data. Okay, um, I can write that out if you want, but um, uh, independent and uh, identically, <laughs> sorry, uh, distributed. Um, so this, is this a good assumption for particle physics data? Like what, what, what am I, you know, is that something? So. That's right, yeah. So the, yeah, so the, the if the detector, uh, you know, collisions, if, sorry, if the detector conditions are changing, right? Uh, so if the, like the, you know, the, the voltage inside of your detector is drifting as a function of time, then the detector is gonna respond differently. And so uh, what, what, what assumption is that gonna break? Are they still? Are they 
Yeah, they're, it'll still be independent, but they're not going to be identically distributed. You're going to want for each one of the collisions to know like what's the corresponding distribution, right? But if you can run your collisions in a nice, you know, stable environment, then uh, and you know we assume that like the quantum mechanics is not changing with time and things like that, then then uh, you would expect it to be identically distributed. Um, and then and then the assumption that they're independent is like supernatural because the uh, you know like this collision and the collision you know five minutes ago don't have anything to do with each other um, so okay great so this is fine um, it's also maybe at this point uh, worth making this connection that the continuous things in the particle physics case uh, p of x um, uh, and the you know th this you know, maybe it seems like this is statistics, this is not physics or something, but what is P of X? P of X is one over a total cross-section times the differential cross-section d sigma dx, right? So you can put and three equal signs if you want, it's like the particle physics, right? That's what we mean. There's a differential cross-section, um, and, uh, and then you just normalize it so that when you integrate it up, you get one, right? So it's, it's very... Uh, and, and actually, I think even more interesting is, so what do you think feels, as a physicist, more fundamental? This probability or the differential cross-section? Probability, differential cross-section. You talk about, yeah, you, you see different, okay, but how is the differential cross-section defined? So this is like, just a little side note here, but you know, Remember how the cross section is defined, right? So at the beginning of the story, you know, you go back to your, your field theory books. What you have is an initial state into a final state. You square it up. You normalize it. And this is the, you know, this is the probability of, you know, I going to F, right? This is the thing that you calculate from first principles in quantum mechanics is a scattering probability, right? And then you're like, okay, this quantity is kind of uh, inconvenient to work with, so I'm going to uh, factorize it into a kind of a flux component uh, times uh, cross section, so that these things, you know, carry, so that this is some um, Lorentz invariant quantity and this thing, and then I can think of these as like, you know, the individual scatterings, and then this is like how many tries I had. But but you're really you're taking this quantity and you're breaking it apart into these two two pieces. So really, at the very beginning of the day, the very most fundamental thing that you start from first principles quantum mechanics is this, is this individual probability. And we're just basically going right back to it, right? So, the, so, um, so I don't think that, you know, so I just want to say that like the, the probabilistic notions here, they go all the way back to like the first principles of quantum mechanics that we're starting with. So we're kind of, uh, it's not that uh, this is some statistics overlay on top of our beautiful, you know, physical theory. This is like, we're doing physics. Um, okay, so, great. So I have now my ID assumption. I have this, I've multiplied all these probabilities. Um, and then I need to, now I need to include uh, this, this, uh, this N here, like the total number of collisions, right? So, um, so how do I predict the total number of, of uh, of collisions, right? So in, in particle physics, th this n is you know how many how many collisions I had here. We can make up some number like you know 32 collisions. Um, how do I make a prediction for n? There's like like uh, you know the probably single most important you know equation you teach for like a collider physics for you know phenomenology or something. Yeah. So how how so. So there's a, lu a luminosity, right? So I'll just write L times a cross section. Okay. So this has, you know, this is units of area. This has units of one over. This is like a time integrated luminosity, if you want. So this is a one over area, right? So like in all the plots, you would see, you know, uh, you you know, you'd see integral L D T equals. So I'll write a script L to make it, you know, equals, you know, thirty. Uh, inverse from to Barnes or something like that on a plot, right? So this is telling you, this is the, what I'm calling L that's not script, is, the, you know, the, the total, you know, in, integrated luminosity times a cross-section. Um, and then, 
But is that, okay, so if I have a particular cross-section, so like let's think about like some, you know, Higgs scattering or something like that, it has a cross-section, I know how much integrated luminosity I have, is that all I do? I just multiply these and that's the ex how many I expect in my plot? There's, yeah, so then there's also issues of, you know, uh, I need to be able, you know, I need the whatever it decayed into to actually hit my detector, so I need to see it. So oftentimes there's a, an acceptance factor, which is usually just the geometrical part of did the, you know, did the particles hit my detector. And then there's often an efficiency factor as well, which is uh, how often would I have found those collisions in my detector because I need to be able to identify my electrons and my muons and all the, and I have some, maybe some uh, region of, uh, of uh, the phase space that I've, uh, I'm including, you know, some, so these are, um, I'm just trying to, uh, you know, this is kind of a typical thing that you would see. And then, um, and then in addition to that, uh, this is, would be, for instance, the cross section for a particular type of process, like the thing that you're interested in, like the Higgs particle, but you would also typically also have some background events, right? which you could try to do the same calculation for and you would just sum them all up for the signals and the backgrounds. Or I can just kind of generically write plus, you know, B, you know, for the background, right? This is what, what you would typically see. And then this would be the prediction for the, uh, the prediction for the number of events, right? So I can, you know, this is a Lumi times a cross section times a acceptance uh, times a efficiency uh, you know, uh, you know, plus uh, background, right? So does this look familiar? This is something that, uh, this is kind of like the way that you often see things. So, so now if, if I didn't care about the, the shape of this distribution, so let's say all I did was just count the number of events. This is like the simplest form of, a, of an analysis is the quote number counting analysis. You just count the number of events. So you would need to, somehow separately have estimated the amount of background there, you would know the luminosity, uh, you would somehow measure your uh, efficiency and acceptance, efficiency and, efficiency and acceptance, uh, and then say you would be interested in measuring the cross-section. Say your goal was to measure the cross-section here. Um, then what would, what would you do? Like if, then like this is a very common thing that you would see is that if, you're, if your goal was to, uh, if your goal is to measure um, uh, to measure uh, sigma, then the kind of physicist uh, would typically want to say, okay, well, this is easy. I'm just going to solve this equation for sigma. So I'll say that, you know, sigma equals, what, N minus B over L times, uh, sorry, uh, uh, efficiency times acceptance, right? And then you're, you're done, right? Does this seem... Does this look familiar to people or, or, or no? I, 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 this is like very, like a, as an experimental physicist, it would be like a very, uh, you know, a common thing to do. And this is often how it's taught in a lot of phenomenology uh, types of, uh, you know, settings. But w one thing that I, I wanted to point out here is that what did we do? In some sense, this was going from the data, right? In this case, the data was more like, you know, the number of collisions, right? And we're inverting it to some parameter of our, of our theory, which in this case is like the cross-section is kind of the parameter of our, of our theory. Um, um, and so, so you see that inversion, but you also see it done in the way that I think a lot of times very natural for physicists is, is in a kind of algebraic sense, right? We took this equation and we solved for sigma. Um, and, and, uh, but there are some issues with doing it this way. Uh, one is it's certainly possible that uh, that the background, like this background number, is a um, is a is a prediction, right? It's, a, it's some expected number of of collisions. So in this example, there could be um, I, I might expect you know uh, uh, 27.3 background events, right? It's totally fine for the number of expected background events to be some. Uh, some non-integer number, right? Because I was also calculating the expected background through a similar equation, a, a luminosity times the cross-section for my background process and efficiencies and acceptances. Um, the other thing is that let's say there's no signal present. So that like, uh, then, um, 
then I would expect the number of events to be equal to uh, the background on average, but the number of events is going to fluctuate, right? So it's certainly possible the number of events would be less than the expected number of background. In which case, you know, if you solve this equation, you get something less than zero. And, and so like, so, you know, so it's very kind of clear what's going on, but at the same time, it, those examples kind of highlight that this is like not how you want to approach this problem, right? Um, the other thing is, of course, the luminosity and the efficiency and acceptances and the background, all these things have uncertainties associated to them. So you'd want to propagate uh, the uncertainty. So maybe uh, when I measure sigma, I might want to think of it as some kind of best guess. Uh, I'll put it as sigma hat, uh, plus or minus, I'll write delta sigma. So if this is kind of my goal, is in the, in the end, I want in my paper to say that I think, you know, I measured the cross section for TT bar fraction or something to be, you know, whatever femtobarms plus or minus, you know, some number of femtobarms, right? This is kind of, your goal is to give something along these lines. Um, then uh, um, this would be maybe one way to do it. This would be, give me the kind of hat notion. Um, uh, but then, and then I would, you know, the kind of typical way is you would look up some, uh, in the PDG, how to propagate uncertainties through this formula, and you would propagate uncertainties on a luminosity and acceptance and efficiency through this formula to get this number, okay? So that approach of doing it is kind of fine, but it's really like the very, uh, it's a very s simplistic way of doing it, uh, and, and it, um, and it sort of only true, it only works if, uh, if, uh, all your uncertainties are very small and things like that. Um, but the reason that I'm kind of telling this story is that it also highlights this notion of the, of trying to invert, invert the, prob the problem. And, and it also highlights this uh, tendency that physicists tend to do, which is to sort of solve this problem. And then you ask yourself the next question, like, okay, now I want to propagate uncertainties. So you just kind of keep stacking layers and layers and layers on top of your statistical analysis and it starts to be very complicated and it starts to be very hard to follow. And I think that's the reason that people have this, you know, a lot of statistics has this reputation of being this very complicated, ad hoc seeming mess, right? It looks very ad hoc when you start adding all these different steps on top of each other. So this is not how I would want to do it, okay? Um, and uh, and it, it also violates one of my rules about the Greek and the Roman uh, because the background here should really be is a, you know, is not a random variable, right? So I would, in terms of trying to fix this up, I would start doing things like uh, write this as uh, new sub B or something like that. This is like an expected number of events for the background. And for the acceptance, I would try to like, you know, avoid, you know, doing something like that and give it some other name and for luminosity. And I would start, you know, fi fixing these kinds of uh, quantities up so that they didn't have, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, so, you know, give this some other name, I don't know, something like that, to, to try to uh, avoid uh, some confusion uh, that, uh, that uh, these are random variables. So when, if you did something like that, then in the end, you know, this would have, uh, this would look something like, you know, I'm just making this all up, so this could, uh, you know, have some other form. The other thing that I'd like to say here is this sigma hat, um, I'm gonna make it explicitly kind of depend on the number of events here, okay? So this is, I, I told you that I would have an exception uh, to the rule about Greek and Roman. It's very, very common uh, when you're trying to estimate a parameter, uh, theta, so theta is a parameter, when you're trying to estimate its value, oftentimes people write something like the name of that parameter with a hat on top of it, okay? Because you're still referring to that parameter but the important point is that this is some function of the data. So this is now a random variable as well. So this sigma hat of n is a random variable, right? And so, and you see it explicitly uh, there, okay. Now, um, okay, so this, I'm telling this kind of roundabout story. I know that, um, uh, and so this is not how I would approach this problem in terms of just kind of algebraically trying to do it. Instead, I would try to do it in a more probabilistic way. So we need to think of what is the probabilistic version of this equation, okay? So, um, so let, me, uh, let, let me think about uh, uh, some example. Let, let's say that we, we fixed the cross-section for this process to be, say, what's predicted by the standard model, and we knew all these other numbers, and when we add them all up, uh, we got something like, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, 27.3. Okay, so that this when we add all of this together, we get 27.3. Um, then what would you what would you expect the distribution for the number of events to be? Right. So th th this we should really think of uh, the number. This this n is is really a random variable. So this equation is broken from the beginning. Right. This is an expectation. This is a random variable. So the, the thing that you really have would be something like, you know, you could put brackets around it or something like that. This would be the true equation, would be the, the average number of events, because the number of events is random, right? So, um, but what is the, I'm trying to elicit from you that the name of a distribution, how do I think about the randomness of what's going on? So, maybe a picture will help. I've got like a bunch of particles flying towards each other, you know, um, um, and another bunch of particles flying towards each other, uh, and then you know there's some chance that this one and this one hit each other, and things come flying off. I have so that this is kind of the picture that relates to the flux, right? And there's a cross section involved. Um, so you could think of there's some number of you know there's some number of tries, some number of possible you know proton proton collisions. There's some probability that they actually collide. Um, so if you want to think at the LHC, the, to the total number of, of collisions that have happened is some enormous, enormous number, right? So at the LHC, there have been something like 10 to the 15 collisions uh, that, that have happened so far. So this is some very, so there's some number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, tries or trials, you know, and then there's, uh, uh, some number of actual collisions that say of the type that we're talking about. Um, so I could give these names, right? So this could I could get, I could call this. Uh, well, here I called it n, right? Uh, this total number of trials we could think of as what, like a capital N or something. And then there is a a probability uh, for collision. And and I can call that say p, okay? Or you know, sure, whatever. Right, this is the basic setup, right? So now if I actually look uh, at the number, this is the number of collisions, here's zero, over here somewhere is capital N, right? So there's a maximum number of collisions, that, like if every one of them happened to hit, right? Then uh, there's a maximum number of possible collisions. There's a zero here, and then somewhere in the middle there's the uh, there's N times P, right, which is the, Expected number of collisions. Do you agree? You agree with that? Okay. So the, um, but what does the distribution look like in the middle? This is like a. This is the same as like, what's the chance that I roll? You know, uh, if I roll a die ten times, that's the number of trials. What's the chance that I get uh, a three uh, twice? Like if I roll a three twice, right? Well, the probability of rolling a three is, for a dice, is one sixth, right? So you can, so you can you can multiply it up. You have a probability for a success, right? You know, success is the collision. So I have p to the n, but then I also need that number, you know, the the complementary number of failures. So one minus p to the capital n minus n. Right, and then there's some combinatorial factor that looks like you know n over n, uh, because I don't care about the order in which they uh, arrive, and so this whole thing is known as the binomial distribution, binomial uh, of n given capital N and P. Right. Okay, so this is what I'm trying to get at. This you can just like from first principles uh, calculate. Right. Um, now in the particle physics setting. Um, like if we're thinking about like Higgs boson collisions, how many collisions did I get that actually produced a Higgs boson, right? Like, I don't know, not very many. You know, depending on what channel you're talking about, hundreds, thousands, something like that. Uh, what capital N? What's that? I mean, that is like some fantastic large number, right? There's 10 to the 11 protons in each collision. They're happening 40 million times a second. You know, so this is numbers significantly larger than 10 to the 15 because that's the number of collisions that are, there have been right so uh, but so so this is some gargantuan number times uh, the probability has to be incredibly small right um, uh, 
So, so there's a limit of this process of this binomial. So there's a limit um, where you t keep uh, n times p equal to, uh, uh, to some constant, which I'll call mu. Um, and, uh, and you take, uh, uh, sorry, there, you take the, sorry, you take the, the, the sorry, you fix uh, n times p equals mu, and then you take the limit uh, as uh, big n goes to infinity of the binomial of, you know, n given n comma p, whatever, uh, and that equals what's called a Poisson distribution, okay? And, the only, and it only depends on one parameter. Okay, so I, this is effectively infinity, right? Um, but there's some expected number, which I'm now calling uh, mu, and then you get some distribution that's peaked around mu, and it's described by a Poisson distribution, okay? And, uh, and, uh, and so I don't know if you know what the equation for a Poisson distribution is. It's a good one to know. Um, Yeah, or me. Yeah, so, so there, you have a e to the, the, the way that you know. There's kind of, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so there's an e to the minus mu part, um, and then there's uh, and then there's over n factorial, and then you need something here, and, and the and the mnemonic that you can remember is that the whole thing needs to sum up to one, right? So what do I multiply e to the minus mu by to get one? E to the mu, right? And then what's the Taylor expansion of e to the mu? Uh, mu to the n over n factorial. And so when I sum it up, I'll get one, right? Okay, so this is the Poisson distribution. Sorry, my writing here is not so beautiful. Um, okay, um, okay, so this is what I was trying to get at. Um, so in terms of the kind of fundamental, you know, <laughs> you know what's going on here uh, in terms of this modeling this data, what I have is uh, out in front, I have a Poisson distribution for uh, n uh, given uh, mu, I'll write it mu here, um, times uh, this probability. Okay, um, and so this is going to, this whole thing is going to be probability of the data. Um, and so it depends on whatever this mu is, you would number of events is, and then, um, and then you would need to know the, the distribution, this, this thing that I'm calling, you know, P of X, the, the, this probability density, right? Okay. Um, and in this, to connect it to this other part of the discussion that we had, um, this expected number N, that is exactly mu. That's this quantity that I called mu, right? So you would take this mu and you would stick it into that spot, and this is how you would uh, this is how you would relate this is how you would build a statistical model for this data. If you wanted to measure the to the cross section, you would think you know just that piece alone. You think of as uh, you know Poisson of n given using this notation. You know eta uh, is like the luminosity times the cross section times an efficiency times uh, an acceptance uh, plus whatever background you would expect. Okay. Um, so this would be the statistical model that you would use, and then you would observe in, and then you would uh, try to figure out uh, how to, to make some inference about the cross section. Was your the parameter that you cared about? Okay. So we still I still haven't told you how you do this probabilistic inversion, how you do the inference of going from x to the parameter that you care about, like the cross section. Uh, but the first thing that you have to do is build a statistical model for the data. Okay. And so we so the um, so in particle physics, when you're talking about counts, it's almost always a Poisson distribution. Okay, so now that I have this Poisson distribution, uh, I can go to the next stage of trying to do inference on, on the, on the, say the cross section if that's the parameter that I care about. And then if I didn't just want to count events, but I also had some shape information, I could augment the, the statistical model with this uh, shape information as well. Is that, is that fine? And, and the way that I've written it right here, this distribution doesn't have any free parameters associated to it, it's just a fixed distribution, but we can start to think of it also having uh, some parameters. So we can think about, for instance, uh, this could depend on some parameters theta. Um, so this, uh, this, you know, P of X could now uh, depend on theta, and then, um, 
And then I'm thinking of this as depending on, say, mu and, you know, theta. Right, so this is the probability of the data given mu, the total number of events, and theta, which is describing the shape of the, of the distribution. Okay, and so this, this kind of thing, this is how, you know, when we, you know, when we discovered the Higgs, this is, this is the form of the statistical model that we use. It becomes, then it becomes, how do I actually build this P of X given theta? How do I connect that to the theory? Um, and, uh, and how do I, you know, model this mu, which is basically some more complicated version of the same thing up here. Okay. Um, all right. So does that uh, sort of make sense so far? Okay. All right. So um, it's been an hour. Um, I think this is a very kind of natural pausing point. So we, what we could do is take like a 15 well, if people have questions, ask them now, then we can take a little 15 minute break and come back and then I'll, I'll go from having a statistical model to like the first stages of doing some inference and then, uh, and then we'll have a break and Jill will take over. Um, okay, so, so does, does anyone wanna ask a question at this stage? Yes. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Uh, the, the Poisson distribution is particularly, I mean, that, that is, there's no approximation in there. Um, so that, that formula um, is accurate even if, uh, if mu is incredibly small. Uh, if that happens, it, though, the, the distribution is going to look like uh, a, a probability uh, e to the minus mu sitting at zero and then some other probability, you know, with that formula sitting at one and essentially nothing else. And, the, and if, as you make, you know, the expected number be much smaller than one, you just get almost all the probability sitting on zero, um, which means you see nothing. Uh, but the, uh, but it's, uh, um, but, uh, but yeah, it's still an accurate, uh, an accurate description of, of what's going on. Um, so, you know, there's many, many experiments for rare phenomena that are all, all in that regime. You know, if you see one event, it's like, you know, a big deal. A lot of times what, what people try to do is, uh, well, well, we can talk about it later, but if you see zero events, you can say what values of mu is consistent with seeing zero events. And in some way, which we'll make precise later, um, the, the kind of uh, rule of thumb is usually an expected number of up to three is still consistent with seeing zero events. But if you expected to see more than three, it starts to be the chance that you see zero events is pretty small. So then it starts to be like, uh, okay, I'm gonna start disfavoring uh, theories that predict more than that. But, uh, yeah. okay. Okay, um, I hope that this is okay. I mean, my goal really is uh, this first lecture is to try to uh, bridge the, the, the physics and the statistics together. So I know that I'm kind of, there's kind of, I'm coming at it from both sides a little bit at first as opposed to just, uh, you know, doing uh, from the bottom up, the, the statistics side. Um, but, uh, okay. Um, then let's have uh, some coffee or something. Thank you. Um. Okay, so I guess we'll start again. Um, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I, I will do my best to not make the chalk squeak, but uh, I, you know, I wasn't doing it on purpose in the first place. So. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, I don't know. If I can give another opportunity if people want to ask questions. I, as some of it, like. Uh, there, there are a few questions that came up afterwards, and a lot of these things, um, I think when you hear them, it sounds very natural and maybe even kind of trivial, but I'll tell you that like in practice, uh, the, a lot of the things I'm saying are like the source of confusion for tons of practicing physicists, so there's a lot of stuff that's more subtle than, than it seems. So, um, so the, <clears throat> I'm just gonna kind of uh, re-comment on a few things. So the, um, so my, my setup in the particle physics case was that our kind of one of the uh, you know core 
idea is, is that the, the data is Poisson distributed. And usually when we start thinking about Poisson uh, uh, types of processes, we think about uh, just counting, uh, counting numbers of events. So you have, for instance, some, uh, you know, I expected, like in my, in my piece of uranium, I expected uh, you know, 27.6 decays in this time interval. And then you look to see how many you know, decays you have in that time interval. And you do it many, many times, and you build up a distribution, and it looks like a Poisson distribution with a mean of 27 point whatever. And, um, and so we usually think of Poisson just in terms of a count and, a, uh, and an expectation. Um, and that's like really at the heart of a lot of particle physics. There are more, uh, a more complicated notion of a Poisson uh, process that goes beyond just um, uh, the, sorry, um, I shouldn't, th this, this kind of limit of a binomial distribution where you, you, your, your axis is the, um, is the, the number of, uh, of successes, you know, um, or the number of, you know, radioactive decays or the number of collisions or something like that, where this capital N, the number of trials becomes basically infinity and you have uh, some expected number, so you get this Poisson distribution. Um, there, uh, a situation like this, where you have uh, some, uh, some other variable associated to it, what I was calling X, this continuous variable, um, and, um, and then you're sampling some number of events where the total number you can think of as a Poisson process, but then there's also some shape information, the way that I wrote it out here. There's another way to think of this, which is where you think of this whole thing as what's called a Poisson process. And this curve uh, is now, you think of it, uh, th this total, let me, sorry, I'm not saying this clearly, um, but, and the way that I, the way that I drew this, this axis was a, uh, this curve re represented a probability distribution for X, right? So this was, this was, uh, this was a probability density. Now, in this drawing, we bend it, right? So you can imagine that in each of these intervals I integrate, right? And I, I integrate in, you know, in, in this bin, um, and I have a, uh, and, and by integrating in, in these little bins, I could make a picture that looked like this, right? And that would be some kind of approximation of this nice continuous story. Uh, but the way that I plotted it here was an, th this axis was a number of events, right? So my, my point is that when you, when you integrate this curve, you get one. When you integrate this curve, you get the, t the total number of expected events, right? So, the, um, so there's another version of drawing uh, this picture right here uh, where you basically multiply the total expected number of events mu, okay? And so, um, and in that, in that uh, case, so if I, if I draw the same thing, um, so if I, if I draw uh, this kind of curve, this could be um, like a, the luminosity times uh, the differential cross-section d sigma dx, okay? And I'll forget about efficiencies and acceptances for, for now. I just, my, my point is that this is, uh, this is a, an event density, right? It's a number of events per unit x, right? Um, and in that case, uh, this curve, so th this picture looks much more like, like this picture. Um, and uh, um, in this case, you call this uh, an, uh, an intensity. And, and then you have you know, uh, some number of you know, the, the, the actual observations happen like this. And you think of this whole thing as, a, as what's called a, uh, an inhomogeneous, uh, I can't spell, uh, oh, you, uh, 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 Poisson process. And then, and, if, uh, and oftentimes people, you know, might, might refer to this as mu of x. Okay, so instead of thinking of it, it's all mathematically equivalent to each other. That, that, uh, that Poisson process is still has a Poisson for the total number and then the shape information. But you can also think of it, uh, there's a different like a set of notation that I'm, uh, where you think of it as a Poisson process for the x's with, a, with an intensity mu of x. And this way of thinking of it is also nice, I guess it's maybe worth mentioning because if you think about something like, uh, you're looking at a picture, 
of, a, of like, you know, the galactic plane. Um, um, and, uh, and you have some, you know, like, a, um, and then you have some diffuse uh, stuff going on and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and this is th this is like right ascension and declination or something like that. And you're looking at the center of the galaxy, uh, and you're say trying to study to see if there's uh, you're doing indirect dark matter experiments. Uh, you might have the the equivalent of uh, of of the story where you say that this might be like the total intensity, which is coming from you know adding together a few different you know uh, like a few different processes, right? You know like you have all these different contributions, which when you add together is this total. So this might be like your signal contribution, some background, and a different source of background. You can think of the intensity here, piece that might be coming from uh, if there actually is a few. Uh, there's like a, a parse from, from pulsar, a part from whatever. And you would have, in this case, you would have an intensity, you know, mu that depends on whatever these two, you know, coordinates are, you know, uh, you know, whatever you want to call these, these two coordinates. All right, um, you know, uh, I'll just call them A and B, I don't know, <laughs> whatever, you know. Um, and, uh, and so in that situation, uh, what's arriving to you in your detector are, are individual plus, uh, photon counts, right? So you get individual photons hitting you, right? And what's the probability that those, a photon hits you in a particular area, right? You know, you, you could, uh, it's, it's, ex it's exactly related to this. So this is also an inhomogeneous Poisson process. It's like a two-dimensional version of it. Um, and so these kind of Poisson statistics and these Poisson processes you see all over the place in physics. Uh, but also the way that, you know, astrophysicists deal with this is often similar to the particle physicists. They, they come up with templates Oftentimes they're bend in terms of these coordinates, um, and then uh, and then they they have essentially a, a formula like this as well. There's uh, or maybe they think of it like this: there there's a, a some number of photon counts in a particular bin, you know. So you would have this particular bin. You would integrate uh, this intensity in that bin, and you would expect a total number of events in that bin, and then you would attach to it. Uh, you know, if this is the ith bin here, you would have uh, Poisson of n i given you know mu i, um, and this uh, mu i you would think of as you know integral in that bin of you know mu of you know a comma b uh, d a d b right, um, and then you would do that for you know each of the contributions in your template you know the pus the the uh, dark matter component and the pulsar component or whatever. Um, and, then, and then you would have uh, many of these bins, and, you'd, and so in the end you'd have a product over I, and that would be how you would model uh, the probability of getting these particular photons over the entire sky, okay? Um, so this is like a two-dimensional version of this way of thinking about it. Um, and so let me say a little bit about, uh, so here we also see it, it's a, uh, maybe I should use a different index, sorry, I'm gonna call, I'll say B for bins, you know, um, so I have the B bin. Uh, I've got too many Bs going on again, sorry. Um, but uh, um, so it's interesting here that if I want to think about this way of modeling the data, the way the natural thing to write would be, um, you know, again, product over B of Poisson of uh, NB given mu sub B, right? So this is, so mu sub B refers to what? Like if this, if I'm in this particular B refers to the height of that bin, right? The expected number, and N sub B is then the the observed counts, right? So you might ask, how are these two things equivalent to each other? Um, and uh, if you actually write out, uh, um, if you think of this, uh, this, uh, let, let me, sorry. When you have this kind of bend picture, um, 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 the, you can also, th it, you know, the, the, there's the way that we just wrote it here, this kind of product of Poissons. There's another way that you can think of it, which is more in, in this picture, where, um, where you think of it as, uh, um, 
the height of this right now turns into uh, uh, mu for that particular bin over the sum of the mu bins, right? So if you just make like a normalized histogram where you divide everything by the total counts, then when you add this up, it's going to be one, right? And you can think of this now, you can think of this curve as, uh, you know, this is your x direction, you can think of this as p of x, right? Because it's going to integrate to one. And so it's a kind of, uh, it's a silly, uh, and maybe you also need to divide by the, you would also need to divide by the bin width if you want to literally integrate it. Um, but you can think of this picture as, uh, as now a probability density function that's piecewise constant. And then what's, what's not immediately obvious is if it's going to be the same thing. One is going to be that you have uh, the, the Poisson for the total number uh, of events, which is the sum over the bins of NB, right? So this total number of events, then mu, which is the, the sum over the bins of of mu b, right, so you have this Poisson piece, right, and then you have times a product of, uh, of uh, the way that I wrote it here, right, so you would, you'd have, uh, um, uh, so this p of x is equal to, you know, for the bin that you're in is just equal to this, you know, mu b over the, the well, the total mu, right, this piecewise constant function, so you'd have times the product of, uh, of p of you know x for for each of the events that you have right so all of all the events that you have falling in a particular bin uh, so this p of x i right so I'm just trying to write it in this form so it's not clear that these two things are equivalent to each other if you if you work it out um, uh, these things are equal to each other up to a, a combinatorial factor that you do with how you place the events into the bins so um, so when you have this product of Poissons, if you write out the actual Poisson for each of them, um, this thing right here is going to end up taking on a particular form, and these two, these two things are, you know, are proportional to each other, these two different ways of, of writing it out. So it's kind of, it seems, you know, mathematically it's some exercise to do, and, and in some ways it seems like it's not clear that they're equivalent to each other, and another way it seems like, of course, they have to be equivalent to each other because it's all the same information just being, you know, shuffled around in different ways. But in the, in the discussion during the break, there were, there were some people that were asking exactly this question about, like, how do I know that this, you know, this way of thinking about it in terms of a bunch of bins is the same as this, uh, thinking about it as a total event count in a, in a shape information. Is that, okay. Um, now the, uh, um, the other thing that I should say is that when we talk about the um, either, you know, when you talk about the expected number of events in a, in a particular bin, right, so this particular mu b, um, it could be uh, for that particular bin, it could be coming from a bunch of different, you know, processes, right? You could have signals and background, like several different backgrounds and different signals that you want to add together. So this might be a sum over, you know, processes, uh, um, so that I'll call you know p and processes or something like that of mu for that bin and that particular process. Um, so and that was kind of implicit. And when I wrote this right when b before we talked about this was a, like a cross section for the signal that I cared about. There was a luminosity term and efficiency and acceptance. So all of this was the expected number of events that I would have for uh, like a signal process. And I just added you know some background con contribution as well, right? So the uh, so there's one way that you can think of is that the prediction for the number of expected events is I just add up all that I could get up, get there and add up the contributions for each of them, um, and uh, and then and then for that particular bin I would have you know this this Poisson term you know this Poisson for the number of you know the number of observed events sorry uh, the number of observed events in that bin given the uh, expected events, or the other way that you can think of it is that you have a Poisson for each of the different processes, and then you're wanting to, uh, you somehow like, imagine for each collision someone gave you a label and they told you about which process it came from. If that was the case, then how do you think about it, right? You, in that case, you would have really, um, you would have uh, an N 
for that bin and a particular process that would be distributed around the, the expected number of events for that bin and for that particular process, and you would have a, a little Poisson distribution, and then you would add them together for all of the different processes, right? So in for the next process, you know, um, for that bin and, a, and, a, and another process, P prime. So if you think of it this way, these, these, these marks right here, these means correspond to like these different lines. And when you add them together, you're really adding together distributions, right? You're, you're imagining uh, for the, you know, how many events did I get from one process? How many events did I get from another process? I wanna add them all together. And when you're adding in that way, it's really, a, it's what's called a convolution of dif different distributions. And so one thing that's an important uh, thing to know for is that when you, if you have two Poissons and you do the convolution, it's also a Poisson distribution and, and you just add together the means. So these two, these are two different ways of thinking about the same, uh, the same thing. One is I can think of it as a Poisson process for, uh, you know, for each of the different types of interactions and I do a convolution, but then that leads to a Poisson distribution with the, with the mean, which is just coming from summing up all the different contributions. Okay. I don't know, there's a word that was kind of confusing, but um, was that, hopefully I didn't confuse more people, but okay, all right. Um, all right, now, um, so another thing that, that was asked, uh, which is a good point, is that where does this P of X given theta come from, right? Like uh, the, way that I, the way that I was presenting it, uh, this was just given to you, all right? It was a very top-down picture, like given some distribution, this P of X, uh, uh, this would be the statistical model, but I didn't say where it came from, right? And I'm kind of tying it to the idea that it's related to differential cross-sections and things. So you could, in principle, compute it, and that's kind of the bottom-up way of getting there. Uh, but the way that I've presented it this far is just kind of from the top down. Um, so, um, um, <clears throat> the, uh, I do want to say a little bit more about that uh, at, at some point. I don't know when the best time to say it is. Maybe, um, I guess now, um, is that if we think about one of these distributions, right? So um, if I have something that looks like, like this and I'm thinking about, think in the back of your mind, some particular, you know, particle physics process or something like that. So we could imagine, you know, pick your favorite, uh, you know, you have some Higgs and, you know, I radiate some jets and then the, and then the Higgs decays into, you know, ZZ into, you know, two jets and, you know, so this could be like Q, Q, you know, uh, you know, two leptons or something like that. And then these jets are going to radiate and do all their, all their things and hadronize and turn into a big jet over here and a big jet over here. So it's some big complicated process. So this is, I'm doing this for Fabio, right? So, so you have, um, so you have some big complicated process. I'm, um, let me draw, sorry. Um, so you have, uh, th that you can simulate, right? So the, the first part of it is, uh, the first part of this is the like parton level interaction which you can use Feynman rules and you can calculate what the differential cross section looks like, right? The next part that has to do with the parton shower um, is not, you can describe kind of what happens you know, for individual gluons, you know, splitting into two quarks or something like that. But the whole, con you know, the whole parton shower is its own series of lectures about how you model. And that usually involves a computer program, right? And then you have the hadronization process where the, you know, the, you know, you get quarks that get together to make you individual hadrons. That involves some non-perturbative physics, right? But this is not the end of the story, right? These particles are then going to, these are now like stable particles flying off into the de detector and they're going to hit the detector, right? And then what's going to happen? They're going to start, uh, you know, you're gonna have like some charged pion or something flying through the detector and it's going to uh, ionize, ionize uh, uh, matter along the way, maybe it will lead to some Shrinkov light, maybe it will have some nuclear interactions. Uh, you have all the uh, things that, uh, this is sort of what gets modeled in something like Jayant. You have a piece over here that gets modeled in something like, you know, Pythia. And then you have a piece on the inside that gets modeled by something like MadGraph, right? 
And, uh, and so then this leads to, you know, the energy deposits in, inside of the detector, right? So you have these, these showers inside the detector. So I get individual in energy deposits inside of my detector, which get related to what the raw data looks like. And then what do we do? We run a bunch of algorithms on these raw data that try to uh, lump them together. They try to take all these energy deposits and say, oh, I think this composite was probably a pion. And you try to estimate the energy of this pion, right? And then you do that for lots of different particles and then group them all together with a, some sort of jet algorithm. And you try to estimate you know, the energy of this quark you know, roughly, and then, and then you, you try to re invert the process again, right? So again, as a, a story, as, as physicists, what are we doing? We have a forward model, right? That's the predictive stage. And then from the data that we observe, we're trying to, the, the reconstruction algorithms go from the raw data are basically trying to invert this process as much as you can and go backwards. But those, those algorithms are also all, tend to be deterministic algorithms, right? Given the collision data, we run a bunch of algorithms and they give us estimates of particles' energies and things, and in the end they might give us an estimate of the Higgs mass, right, for that particular collision, and it's a totally deterministic algorithm. Um, now the, the thing that I'm, one of the things that I want to get at, and this is like really, it's a very simple point, but I think uh, it's something that was never really highlighted in the way that we talked about doing, uh, you know, physics until kind of recently, is that if, if in the end, if I think of this stage of what my, you know, of what the electronics of my detector read out, like that's the raw data, I can think of that as X, right? Or some higher level quantity, uh, I'll call it, you know, like, uh, you know, X prime, which is some like summary of, I have like raw data, like so you're here like X raw, and then here's like X reconstructed, whichever, this is just some function of X raw, right? The, of the raw data. Um, the, the, if I wanna think about what does this distribution look like, um, let's, let's spend some time on that. Um, this is, I'm spending time on this partially because I wanna try to help motivate uh, Gilles' lectures a bit. Um, um, So this is gonna seem really silly in a way, but I want to, for instance, model, uh, let's just say the raw data or what, whichever version of X, uh, given some parameters of my theory theta, right? Uh, how do I get there? Well, the, these simulations that are happening, um, do, what's the term that, do you know what the term that, you know, particle physicists usually refer to this entire simulation chain as? Like, tend to people just refer to it as Monte Carlo. Like it's like a, um, and so the, so what we will do is have these, these codes, for instance, for the, for the internal piece right there for MadGraph, you have a differential cross section, right? So, um, so, and now instead of writing it, uh, you know, D sigma DX, I'm gonna write it D sigma D, D phi, because this is like the phase space of the parton level. Um, th this, this formula, you know, the, the different cross-section we, you know, is things like MathGraph give you computational code that if you go to a particular point in phase space, if you say what the energy and momentum of all of the, you know, partons are, you can evaluate this function. But to do the, you, if you want to know the total cross-section, you would need to integrate it. But we don't know how to do that with a pencil and paper. Um, so it gets integrated numerically. And it tends to be that those integrals, the way they work is through a, is through a, a, a Monte Carlo type of integration. So I don't know if, if anyone's, are you familiar with the idea of Monte Carlo integration? Yeah, but you know, like, but roughly you're imagining that you have some, you have some what could be like complicated distribution and, and you're sampling from it, right? So from this, from this function, you're trying to produce some samples and the Monte Carlo integral is basically saying that the integral, uh, you know, if I think of this as, you know, P, P of X or something, or, you know, whatever, the integral of, of P of X times some integrand, so I could call it, you know, f of x uh, dx is approximately equal to one over n times the sum of i equals one to n of uh, f of xi, 
right? Uh, as long as the xi are dis distributed according to p of x. Does that make sense? So if, if this is p of x and my samples are, you know, I've got a lot of samples here because the probability is big and then some there and then some over there. If my, my samples are, are drawn proportionally to this density, then I can estimate this integral as just, you know, adding up a bunch of uh, uh, samples from, I mean, adding up the evaluation of the integrand um, in that way. So, so this is the idea of Monte Carlo integration, right? Um, so in the case of the, 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 uh, of the parton level uh, uh, kinematics, the, the phase space is usually fixed, right? It's usually like 15, 20, 30 dimensional phase space. Um, but then when you start getting to the parton shower, uh, it's, it's really a decision that's happening like at every, you know, the, the process, the, describing the, pro, the parton shower is much more complicated because you, the number of uh, splittings that you have is random, right? You can have, you can have a, you know, fewer or more. So the dimensionality of, the, of, of that uh, is, uh, is changing, but the way that it happens is still a sampling procedure. So it doesn't really look like a nice, you know, uh, some function with a fixed domain that you're sampling from but you, you have this now, this parton shower that's a more complicated thing because the domain that, you know, over which it's describing a distribution has got a kind of, you know, a random nature of like what, how, you know, what the dimensionality looks like, but you can still sample from it. And then when you get to the JANT stage, um, we, again, you have like, we have programs that imagine that you're like a, a pion flying through uh, some material and you look up in a, in a database like what's the chance of having a nuclear interaction inside of iron and I know that this screw that I'm traveling through currently is like you know 90% iron and you know 10% copper or something like that right so you uh, so that the, all these codes uh, they, they do random sampling but they're, they're referred to as Monte Carlo and in the end you get um, that each one of the uh, fully simulated events that we have for the the uh, Atlas and CMS experiments, if you think of the XI here as like the raw electronic, you know, response of the detector for a simulated event, uh, you can think of it as a, as a it's a, they're, they're produced from a simulation that's doing a Monte Carlo sampling, but you can think of this P of X raw as coming from, um, you started with uh, P of, well, right at the same way that I did here, I guess, you know, uh, uh, phi given uh, theta, so this would be the kind of uh, uh, the the hard scattering part of it, you know, uh, hard scatter. Um, and then you have uh, p of uh, I'll use a uh, I'll I'll use the phrase z here z uh, parton shower uh, given given the uh, uh, given the kinematics, right? So. First, you generate, uh, you, you sample phi, some particular parton level kinematics according to uh, the, the matrix element, you know, this piece right here. Um, then from, given the, the, the uh, parton, you know, kinematics, you do uh, the parton shower. And then uh, given the parton shower, uh, you do the, the jayant piece, you know. So jayant given uh, z, you know, parton shower, okay. So you have the simulation is doing all of this, and then at the end you might have, uh, um, then you have you know p of x given z jant, you know jant. Um, so you, the the and then you can think of an, a gargantuan integral over uh, d z uh, 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 jant, uh, d z parton shower, and d um, well, here I wrote, you know, phi or like that, basically the, the, the hard, uh, hard scattering. This symbolic integral is what that simulation chain is doing, right? Does that make sense? So this, uh, this, money, this simulation process that we run, you can think of it symbolically as doing this gargantuan integral. And, uh, and then that gives you, at the end, is telling you what the probability of giving this particular raw, you know, detector readout is. So... If you wanted to think of, you know, given a particular raw detector readout, it's going to end in one of these bins, right? 
So you can think of this as just kind of just generally P of X. Like if, if I ask what's the chance that I get into this bin, this invariant mass bin, after at the detector level, I need to think of, you know, the way that you would calculate it is you would do, run the simulation many, many times, take all the simulated data and make a histogram, and then, you know, the number of events in this histogram bin is basically, you know, is doing this. It's saying one over the total number of simulated events, and then this F would be basically one if you end in the bin and zero if you don't end in the bin, right? And so, uh, so this is how you would make that histogram bin would be this, and you can think of it as, uh, as you know, estimating this integral, right? So why am I bothering with all of this is that, um, do you think you could do this integral like with in, in any other, in any kind of, this is a totally impossible to do integral, right? You can sample from it effectively using Monte Carlo techniques, but it's totally impossible that you're going to actually get this function, this density probability of the data given theta. Uh, even if the raw data is just, even if you reduce the raw data to just one number, you know, it's not that, that you know, the, it's not because X is high dimensional, even if you just think of, you boil all the data down to like an invariant mass, uh, to, to calculate the density uh, or the, you know, you would have to do this gargantuan integral and that's basic, that's intractable. Okay, so this is a, uh, you know, is intractable. <laughs> um, okay, and so the, um, and so, so the, what's happened very recently um, is that, uh, is that, um, is that somehow we, as, as physicists, we've been doing this forever, but we haven't really like recognized that this is like a, a very critical aspect of being a, a physicist is that, is that the, the, the probability of density or the statistical model for the data from our real first principles you know, description of what's going on is intractable. And, uh, and part of the reason is that we, what we do usually is we sample with Monte Carlo techniques and then we make these histograms and we think of these histograms, I mean, they're approximating this. That histogram is approximating this function, right? But it's, it's not the actual thing, right? Because if nothing else, you have a finite number of Monte Carlo samples, right? So if you did the whole process again, you would have a different number of Monte Carlo samples in that bin, so they're going to be kind of fluctuating a little bit. And also, you're 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 also you know approximating whatever is happening, you know whatever is that's not constant inside of that bin, right? So, so this uh, um, so this histogram approach has been working well for us. Okay, it's the way that we do most things. Um, but the other problem with the histogram bin, uh, uh, the histogram approach, is if you it works pretty well if x is one-dimensional. But what if I want to try to describe uh, the, the probability distribution uh, for many different variables at the same time? Like say I want to think of a more fully differential version where X might involve like 10 different angles and energies. Can I make a histogram in 10 dimensions? Right, so to make a histogram in 10 dimensions, you know, I mean in two dimensions you're thinking about, you know, you know the, something like this, right? Um, so if you want, you know, if you want n bins per, direct, per direction, you, you know, it's the, in terms of the number of dimensions, it's growing exponentially, right? So the amount of, of data that you need to fill a histogram in high dimensions is growing exponentially with the number of dimensions. So, so if you want, you know, three-dimensional histograms or something, you're going to have just like a, a gargantuan number of bins, and you're never going to be able to fill these histograms. So the, the way that we've been approaching data analysis and particle physics based on histograms kind of, you know, forces us to work with these very low dimensional, uh, uh, you know, discriminating variables or summary statistics or or whatever you want to call them that describe the collisions. And we know now is that like, there's often quite a bit of information hiding, uh, you know, if we just choose one of these variables, we might be losing a lot of information. And, uh, and so with machine learning, part of the idea is that you're going to be able to, uh, can we use a higher dimensional version of the data? Something closer to like the raw version of the data or something that inclu includes like, let me describe the event with all of the particles, energies, and momenta. And in that case, th this is the quantity that I want to estimate and this might be some fairly high dimensional object, okay? And so the histogram approach is not going to work um, and so is there some other way that I can try to estimate this density, this probability density? Um, 
And so what that, that generally what that phrase that's being used right now is called uh, uh, likelihood um, free uh, inference. Okay, and so the, so the idea is we're going to want to still do statistical inference on the parameter theta, uh, but this thing right here, this, this part of the statistical model, when you fix the data and you think about it as a function of the, of the parameter, that's what's, what's typically called the likelihood. But because the likelihood involves this intractable integral, we don't know what the likelihood is. So is there a way that we can approach inference uh, when we, we have a forward model of, the, of, the, of what's going on, so we can simulate in the forward mode, uh, but we can't you know, evaluate this huge integral, and that's what this, like, this uh, set of likelihood-free inference techniques is, is about, and some of the work that Jill and I have done, which maybe I'll talk about later on, uh, it, it uses, uh, uh, uses uh, machine learning techniques uh, 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 use machine learning basically to uh, to try to estimate um, this uh, p of of x given theta. So it's not that in some sense you still end up trying to estimate p of x given theta, the likelihood, and then from that estimate you do normal statistical inference. Uh, but we're going to use machine learning techniques to try to uh, approximate basically this intractable integral. So that will be something that we can talk about later. Okay. But what's funny is that it's always been there. You know, since the 60s you know, particle physics data analysis has involved these histograms. We've been doing, you know, likelihood free inference for a very long time, but we never somehow uh, were kind of drew attention to the fact that this, that this is really, this forward model, this is what includes all of our physics knowledge, but it, uh, it leads to a description of the data that's like intractable and not very useful. It's also one of the reasons that a lot of uh, statistical analysis of particle physics data looks fairly ad hoc is because if you just knew this likelihood, it would be very simple, but the, the, the actual likelihood involves all of this physics, and depending on what you're doing, you know, you, you, you might not be able to, like, approximate this thing very well. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the, the other thing that I, I, I'd like to say here is that because this thing is intractable, you know, the, the two ways that you see very common, one is that you run the simulation many times and you build these histograms, and that's like your prediction for what's going on. The other thing that you see fairly often, um, so for instance, uh, it, when the discovery of the Higgs, there were the two primary channels um, were, yeah, I'll go. The, the two primary ways that we discovered the Higgs were the four photon channel and the two photon channel. Um, and uh, the, four, the four lepton channel, so that we, we plotted the invariant mass of the four leptons, and uh, it looks, you know, it looks kind of like, uh, kind of like this with a, the Higgs peak in the middle, but it was really a bunch, it was a histogram-based approach. So you had a bunch of histogram bins, so I'm drawing a smooth line, but really it was a histogram, so you had, you know, all these bins of a histogram. Um, and uh, uh, so that was, uh, uh, that approach, and then for um, the two photons, you had M gamma gamma, and it looks like some smoothly falling thing with a little bump on top, right? Um, so my point here is, in, in the four lepton approach, it was uh, it was a uh, um, it was based on uh, histograms uh, from the uh, quote, you know, Monte uh, Carlo. Uh, simulation, and in that case, it's like what I was talking about before. You have this very clear connection to the to the underlying theory. In the case of the of M gamma gamma and, and the uh, Higgs to two photons, um, this they did not use a, a histogram. If you were going if you're going to do a histogram, you would need to include things like uh, uh, processes um, that look like. Uh, uh, like this, say like these would be gluons, this is a loop of quarks and, and it radiates off two photons. And, uh, and you would also need to do things like this where you have, for instance, uh, well you just have you know, more, well, I'll just draw it this way, more gluons coming off, it doesn't need to be a box there. Uh, but the gluon leads to a jet and the jet fakes a photon. 
Okay, and if you, in that process of a jet faking a photon is very sensitive to all sorts of detector level things. And you don't really feel confident that you're confident enough that you can describe that with simulation at the level of accuracy that's needed. Um, so what was done here is actually that there's so many events and the data is, you know, like the, the data points is, are nice, very nice and smooth, you know. Um, uh, that this was just fit to something like there there were two approaches. One of them was basically just a falling exponential that looked like m to the minus m gamma gamma over some, you know, over some decay constant, just a, literally a falling exponential. Or the other thing was a, a, a fourth degree polynomial. So it was like a, you know, a polynomial of, uh, of degree four, you know, of m gamma gamma given, you know, like uh, theta, you know, one theta two, you know, theta three and theta four. Okay, but this is a, it's a polynomial, right? So my, my point about this is that in the actual discovery of the Higgs, yeah, there was, a, there was a fit to a smooth function because the data looks nice and smooth and then you were looking for a bump on top of it. So you had this polynomial plus a model for the Higgs, you know, you know plus the bump, you know. Um, and the, the thing that I'm getting at here is that the statistical model here, that the polynomial was this piece right here, right? You had a Poisson count and then a polynomial model for this smooth description or a polynomial plus a bump. And in the case of m to four leptons, it was the histogram approach. So why am I going on about this is that if you think about like in this situation, what's interesting is that you know, you're saying you're testing the standard model of particle physics, but from a statistical point of view, you know, the, the statistical model you're using is like very loosely connected to the standard model, right? I mean, it's a, this is some falling exponential or a fourth degree polynomial. Uh, it's not, uh, it doesn't have the same kind of history behind it uh, that these do that are know about all of the uh, statistics along the way. So one of the things I wanna get at is that uh, when you're doing the statistical modeling of the data, you have a lot of freedom in terms of how you you know, how you do it. But if you see, it, uh, if you see uh, some discrepancy here, um, you know, the claim that you're actually seeing the Higgs particle as opposed to it's just that the, your fourth degree polynomial or something is not like the right description of the data is, is much weaker, right? But in both cases, the reason that we're, we're having to like, you know, why are we even bothering to approach this problem is because uh, one, those integrals are intractable and two, you might worry that the actual simulation code is not, you know, of high enough fidelity and not accurate enough to de try to describe these very rare phenomena like jets faking photons and things. So, um, okay, so this is not really, I'm just kind of going on, but the, but what, what I, I'll, I'll end with basically is that there's a, um, there's a lot of, in, in the statistics lectures that have been given for high energy physics, many times what it is is that people just start off with this statistic, like this this model, and then the rest of the time is talking about um, about uh, confidence intervals and CLS and Feldman cousins and a lot of statistical things that happen after this stage. And as you've noticed thus far, I've not talked about anything about actual statistical inference. Really, I've only talked about the statistical modeling, right? And the reason for that is that basically once you make the statistical model, most of the rest of it is like a you might need to learn it, but it's basically a, a recipe. I mean, it's like a machine. You, and we have built, for instance, a statistical framework called RUSTATS, where you provide this, you provide this thing, it does all the statistical tests for you, okay? So in some sense, you can abstract that stuff away, and it's still good to know and conceptually what you're doing, and so I'll talk about it. Uh, but as a working physicist, like by far the most important thing is about building the statistical model of the data. And you see that there's, you know, there's a very wide range of, of approaches that come from these very like effective models to these uh, very simulation driven things. The, the idea about now this uh, machine learning based likelihood free inference. So most of your attention, all your physics insight goes into building the statistical model. And so, uh, yeah, so like that's really in some sense the place that, uh, y you know, most of the time, if you want to improve the statistics of your of a analysis, it's going to go into building a better statistical model, not in terms of like doing the downstream statistical analysis better. So that's why I'm spending so much time kind of beating this this horse. So, okay, all right. So thank you. <laughs> um, so I don't know if there are any. I should stop, but 
Does anyone want to ask a, any questions? Or? Yeah. 